Hi folks and you're very welcome to this video on short examination questions for Leaving Cert Geography. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and go through a round of short questions from the 2016 higher level geography paper just to give you an idea of what to expect, how you go about answering them, the way the marks are broken down and I suppose how you can try and work through them as quick as possible. So in the exam the short questions are worth 80 marks and that gives you about half an hour to actually get through them so these are the questions where you want to try and make up as much time as you can for the rest of the exam because I suppose it's the easiest place to make up time not always not every year if we just scroll back up uh, what it'll tell you is to attempt any 10 questions because all the questions carry equal marks because 12 questions going to be on it you get marked on your best 10 my advice as I'm sure your teacher's advice will be is to do all 10 questions or all 12 questions and let the examiner mark you on your best 12 and it'll make your life a bit easier um just a sort of little asterisk as we go ahead i have the aerial photograph and the os map for this in a hard copy format so i'm not going to be able to swap between them so when we do come to those questions i'll be using those but i do have videos on this channel on some of the stuff they're going to be asking you for if you need help with that so let's go straight into this then so the first question on this 2016 paper is asking you to match the letters A, B, C, D, E, and F with the correct place on the diagram above. Now, this is a very common question. Often does come up as a plate tectonic, volcano, earthquake type of question. And all you've got to do is match up where each of them goes. So the first one, the continental crust, well, we can see clearly that that is going to be E because it's up here. It's, it's the line of the crust and there's no C on top of it, so it has to be the continent. The ocean trench, then we know that that's going to be D because we know that the ocean trench forms here where two plates collide and that zone of subduction just above that is where you get your ocean trench. Your mountain range, again straightforward enough, is F up here. You can very clearly see the mountains on the map. Oceanic crust, well it has to be the one that's not the continental crust and again you can clearly see that there's an ocean on top of it so it's B. Your subduction zone, which I talked about earlier, is here is A. That's where the two plates collide. And one plate the heavier plate usually the oceanic plate will sink underneath the lighter plate and then your magma chamber here is c we know that it's here it's going to be in the crust under usually a volcano um and then it's asking you to indicate whether the following statement is true or false and you have to circle the option plutonic igneous rocks are formed at sea and that is absolutely true plutonic igneous rocks are ones that are formed inside the earth's crust and then just for your reference all of these are worth one mark and down here is worth two marks and that's your eight marks overall and it's going to be marked that way anyway time or anytime it does come up question number two then is asking you on volcanic activity so again you've got to match them up this time with the correct labels and the photographs so we know here that the pyroclastic flow is going to be b because what you're looking at is the flow that's coming down the side of the volcano the lava fissure eruption is going to be C because you can clearly see the crack in the ground and the lava, magma, whatever you want to call it, the fire coming out of the ground. Ash cloud, again, a straightforward enough one. It's, it's very evident here in D, your, la or your ash cloud. And then your lava vent eruption has to be A, not only because it's the first one, but also because, or not because it's the last one that's left, but because you can clearly see the eruption happening from out of the vent. Part two then is asking you to indicate whether each of the following statements is true or false by circling the correct option. So basic lava has a very high silicon content. Uh, that's true, it does not. It has low silicon content and because of that it's very runny. And then lava with a high silicon content is most associated with explosive eruptions. That is true and that's because the gases get trapped and so when they do get released it causes many explosions and that creates a really explosive volcanic eruption. The marking scheme again here is one mark for each of these up here and then two marks for both down here and that gives you eight overall. C then moves on to coastal landforms and rock structures have been grouped together here. So again, you're looking at a photograph and you're trying to match up the labels with each of them. So match each of the letters A, B, C, D, E and F with the coastal landform or rock structure that best matches it in the table below. So the first one we're looking for here is a joint. Now, we know that the joint is going to be a crack 
on the uh in in the rock layers it is b because you can see the crack very clearly happening all the way along here uh your wave cut platform then is c because i mean you can see up here cliff which we're going to see in a minute is going to be d and in front of that then is your wave cut platform which is, a, which is a flat area of rock in front of the cliff rock fall well again that's straightforward because you can clearly see all of the rocks have been knocked down so that's going to be your a a c cave so you're looking for anywhere on the map or in the photograph that's going to be a cave and i can see that over here at f so your c cave is f a headland is going to be e because it sticks out here onto the uh <laughs> it sticks out into the coast so that's going to be e and then your bedding plane is the only one that's left is d so that's a horizontal joint in the rock now it's a bit hard to see it on the photograph but you can see it and by process of elimination we're going to know it's d anyways and then again you indicate whether the following statement is true or false rock structures such as joints and bedding planes are most associated with igneous rocks we know that's false because they're associated with limestone rocks so again the mark scheme here is one mark for each of these all the way down along and then two marks down here and that gives you your eight overall sticking on the team of rocks this time with question four, we have to fill in the table using the the, um, the words that they've given us. So this, we're using the source material most associated with that rock and then the metamorphic rock that it forms into. So this is really testing your rock cycle knowledge. So sandstone, we know that the source material is going to be sand. Even if they didn't give it to you, you would know that. Limestone, we know that it's going to be shells and fish bones. Shells and fish bones or fossils, as you may know them as, but the same thing and granite we know it is magma it forms under the earth's crust when magma cools and solidifies the metamorphic rock that it forms into then so sandstone we know forms into quartzite limestone forms into marble and then granite forms into gneiss um, so again testing your understanding of the rock cycle there how rocks form and how they change into each other and then they're asking you to name the rocks most associated with each of the following Irish locations. Now, be very careful here because they're not saying that you need to use the same rocks from above. So what could be very common here is people will try and use those words. Now, one of them will be correct, but we know that the Antrim Plateau or the Giant's Causeway, that's going to be basalt and the burn is limestone. Uh, the year that this did come up in the paper, granite was put down for the Antrim Plateau because people knew it was igneous rock, but they thought they had to use the rocks up here and the way that this is marked each of these are all worth one mark and that will add up to your eight mark so a lot of information needed there but again if you know your rock cycle you'll have flew through this question uh, question number five then is looking for os maps skills so it's asking you to match each of the following landforms with the grid reference that best matches its location on the os map in the table below so they have given you the four landforms and then in addition to that you have to tick whether they're glacial fluvial or coastal so as i said because i can't flick between the map and the paper i have the hard copy here so we're going to quickly go through this i'm going to try and edit out any gaps as well that i have while i'm trying to find these things uh, so l9578 starts off this is your cut off meander uh, sometimes known as an oxbow lake. L9378 is a V-shaped valley. Um, we know this because the contour lines are very close together. You've also got brown shading. So that indicates very steep slopes on either side. And that's what tells you that it's a valley shape. L9483 is a lagoon. Again, it's where it has been cut off from the sea. And L9285 then is our drumlin. So again, you'll identify the drumlin because the contour lines will show the different shape and that one side will be steeper than the other. And then to go through which one of the are, you know, meander is fluvial, V-shaped valley is fluvial, lagoon is coastal, and a drumlin is glacial. Uh, the mark scheme here, all of these are all worth one mark. So they're going to add up to eight and that's eight marks for that question again sticking with our os map 
this time it's asking you to calculate the approximate area in square kilometers of Westport Bay, south of Northing 85 and east of Easting 90, west of Easting 95. Um, <laughs> I've been confused myself there. It's a good idea to highlight what they're actually asking you for here. So south of Northing 85 and west of Easting 95, because you can confuse yourself and you can go north of 85 and east of 95. Um, again, I can, unfortunately I can't show you, but I have it here, so I'm going to calculate it out. So I have come back with somewhere about, I think it's about seven kilometers squared. Um, I'm going to have to check what the, uh, I'm going to check the markets and see what that is. Uh, what is the aspect of the slope? M037784, so the aspect is the direction that it's facing. Uh, so I can see here that it is, I mean, if they want to be exact, it's north-northwest. Um, they probably will accept northwest as well. But for me, that's north-northwest. Measure the straight line distance in kilometres from the post office in Westport Town to the post office at M033804. So you need to find your post office in Westport and then the post office at that point. Get your ruler out, measure it, and then line it up against the scale they give you on the legend and find what it is. So when I've done it here, I've come out with about 5.5 kilometers. Uh, I, I'll check the mark, see, just to double check that for you. And then part four, give a six figure grid reference for the trailhead on the way marked walk in the south of the OS map. So if I take a quick look at this, um, so you see, so you're looking at the trail head now on it. So that's where it's going to start. So for me, it's L because you need to put in your subzone letter. 972793. I will going to double check just to make sure. So just checking the marking scheme there. So the answer for part one here is going to be six to eight kilometers squared. So anything between those two will get you two marks. Um, north northwest is the answer, but they did accept northwest either, so that's enough for two marks. Here they accepted anything from 5.3 to 5.7 kilometers, and that will give you two marks. And then here they accept this one, but they would also have accepted three or a four on this for your two marks, and that adds up to eight marks. We move on down along then to question number seven. Again, we're looking at the OS map, so you need to find and locate the point L93781 and Y L937825. And then you get, you're given an elevation profile. This is some of the more difficult one, and I'll have a video on this coming out very soon. Um, because this is one that students struggle with quite a lot. So what you have to do is match each of the letters A, B, C, and D on the elevation profile above with the feature on the OS map that best matches it in the table below. So we'll do that then. So the R355. So if you get your ruler and you just mark between those two points that they say here and leave it on it and then you're I mean, look at you you're going to give a good estimate of what it is i can clearly see the road is the furthest one to the right and so that that's going to be d the owen we river uh that looks to be the furthest to the left so i'm going to give that as a a conical peak um without even looking at the map i know that that's going to be b because looking at your elevation profile it has to be the highest one on it and then the way marked walk is going to be C by process of elimination. And then you have to indicate whether the feature in the table below is part of the physical landscape or the cultural landscape by ticking the correct box. So the R335, you would say it is cultural landscape because it's not physical. It's not part of the physical landscape. The landscape didn't create this by itself. The Onry River, that was created by the landscape or it created the landscape as well. The Conical Peak is landscape. The way marked walk is not. It's cultural. And the marking scheme then for all of that is each of these are getting one mark. And that gives you your eight. Uh, working now on to the aerial photograph. You look at the map of Westport and then you need to locate the features A, B, C, D on the aerial photograph come from the paper. So again, like the OS map, I have the aerial photograph here beside me. I have divided it into my nine grids and i need to 
the street lamp and hello world's across town. So the orientation is slightly different. So I need to work out the orientation first and then I'll figure out the location of the features. Okay, so I'm coming back here. So the fair green that I have seen this on the left middle ground. The car park I found at center middle ground, so right in the center of the map. Now remember they're asking you for the car park mark C up here, not just any car park. And again, that's where people will make up and make uh, fall down. The North Mall, which is marked as D, um, I have found that to be again in the center middle ground. And the leisure center, I found that to be in the right middle ground. Uh, it can be a very difficult thing to do to try and compare two maps with each other. So even if it's an extract of the same aerial photograph, because you need to turn it, change it, and get your orientation right. But once you can get that trick down, you're going to be away with it. Uh, so again, these are all worth two marks. That gives you eight overall. Moving away then, we're coming on to our weather chart. So we need to uh, examine the weather charts above and the cloud charts below and then match them up. So the look and can you read from a weather map what the weather or the, I suppose in this case, what the cloud cover is going to be like. So the first one here we're looking at where you have, the first thing that's coming to my mind here is you have the anti-cyclone here beside it, or well, it's in a circular pattern. So we won't until we look at the map. Um, but I can, again, I can clearly see up here on D, you have that pattern there. And so that's given you, D is gonna match up with number one. Two then, so looking at the air mass, I can see the line, you're, you know, what draw the lines on and you watch for them. And again, I can see it matches up perfectly with A. Uh, da -da -da -da, the third one then, so it's a little bit more scattered, but I can see just to the south of Ireland, there's a little circular area coming there and I can see it matches up here at C. So I'm going to put in C and then I know that B is going to be here. And just to double check, you've got the high pressure here and you get very little cloud cover with high pressure. So we have very little high pressure here. And then you add those up, you get your two, your two, your two, and your two. And that gives you eight marks. Keep coming down along, then we come on to question number 10. And we're looking a little bit more then at regional geography. So name the most northerly European Union member state in the Eurozone area in 2015. So we're looking at the EU member states in the Eurozone, which are marked as blue. I mean, the most northerly one we can see very clearly here is Finland. Um, obviously, you need to know the European countries. That's, I suppose that's the skill that's been asked for here. Part two then is indicate the total number of European Union member states in the Eurozone area in 2015 by correct by ticking the correct box. So you need to count them up. Um, I just happen to know that off the top of my head that it is 19, um, because I suppose that's what you would have studied in class anyway. And then name two European Union member states not in the Eurozone area in 2015. Now, obviously, since this exam came out, Brexit has happened. So I, for that purpose, I'm not going to count this. But I am going to go with Sweden, uh, which is this country here. And let's go with Poland. Now, again, there was plenty of options you could have had around here. Um, take your pick and then name two non-European Union member states using the euro in 2015. Uh, so you're looking for two non-European Union member states using the euro in 2015. And the answer is actually given to you here. So you can pick any two of them. So I'm just going to pick the first two. Andorra, which is here. And let's go with Monaco. And for reference, Monaco is here. And the way that the marks are given for this one here, you get two marks for Finland, two marks for 19, and then one marks for each of those to give you eight. Now we're looking at a table, and you're going to have to use your skills to interpret that data. So examine table above, which shows the number of Irish-born people living abroad in selected regions, and then answer the questions that follow. Which region in the in the table below above had the largest number of Irish-born residents in 2013? So looking at the 2013 table, and so which of them had the largest number of born Irish-born residents? 
Um, well, I mean, it's very clear here this is going to be the UK. 412,000. How many Irish born people were living in New Zealand in 2000? So we go to our 2000 line, we go to New Zealand. That's going to be 6, 5, 9, 7. Calculate the increase in the number of Irish born people living in Poland between 2000 and 2013. So if we go to Poland, we go to 2000, we go to 2013. Uh, we do some maths, you take 74 from 8136 and it's going to give you 8062. Yes, it is. Uh, and explain briefly one reason for the increase in the number of Irish born people living in Poland between 2000 and 2013. Uh, well, Poland became a member of the European Union and so that meant that you had free travel. So that's what you can write in. Poland became EU member in, oh, I think it was 2004, I want to go with. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember the correct year. You could probably just say it became an EU member. And this meant Irish citizens could travel freely to Poland. Your marking scheme then for this question, so you got two marks for UK, two marks for New Zealand, two marks for doing your sums right. You would then get one mark for the first point you make and you get one mark for the second point. So one mark for saying it became a new member, one mark for saying Irish citizens could then travel freely to it. Graphical interpretation then, so now you're given a graph and you have to again answer questions on that. So question one, which airport had the largest increased share of total passengers in 2013. So if you compare them up, I think it looks like it's going to be Dublin. Uh, seven. Yeah, it's going to be Dublin. So Dublin Airport. Number two, which airport had the second largest percentage share of total passengers in 2005? So it's going to be this one here, which is Shannon. Calculate a decrease in Shannon Airport's percentage share of total passengers from 05 to 13. So you minus one from the other, and it should give you, I think, 7.6%. I explained briefly one economic effect of a decrease in passenger numbers at Shannon Airport on the Shannon region. So the first thing you're looking at here is there will be fewer tourists in the region. There's less money spent. Which could lead to unemployment. So again, you're just making your point and then just briefly explaining it. The marking scheme for this question is going to be two, 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 and then again one plus one to give you your eight. Uh, so they are all of your short questions. So we have done that in approximately 23 minutes. Now, to give you half an hour to do it, there's also a little bit of time I took up at the start. And then, of course, me actually explaining it to you took up time as well. You could do that probably in somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes. And that saves you 10 minutes then on your long questions. So there is a bit of an act to do in the short questions. I will do more years. Um, over the coming weeks and months just to give you the practice of it i would recommend that you follow along at home or go back again and watch this video download it if you haven't got the exam papers and go through it the best study you will ever do is to practice exam papers it will test your knowledge on pretty much all the chapters so you can't sort of just focus on some areas like you might do for the essays but they're an easy way to build up marks and if you can get the technique right, it's going to save you time that you can use elsewhere. For now, though, I hope this video was useful for you. And here's some other videos that you might enjoy.